I have it confirmed from a theology faculty here that wrestling is can be considered sacramental in the Bible. And God oh, because he, yeah, okay. That's right. Well, fair enough. Christian worldview. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> All right. So let's. Um, so if I were asking a quiz today, the question I may have asked is, what's the difference between a bounded and an unbounded buffer? Would that have been a good one or a bad one? Good one. What's, so what? Is, what is the difference? <laughs> By something. They're all. Okay. Bounded is one where, like, it's a Tuesday night and there's some good shades of gray on All right. TV. So, bounded buffer is a buffer where, we, where the user has specified a, well, the, the writer of the operating system has specified a maximum storage size, where an unbounded one would be like a linked list where it would not have a specified uh, size where we can just literally keep filling up. Um, uh, we have good math that, with modulus that allows us to keep wrapping around inside of a single array, even in a bounded buffer. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the side effect is we can only have so many things in the buffer at once. Okay? So we can create a limit for uh, uh, how many things we want to share a certain resource. Because remember, we're talking about all this inside of the context of, um, uh, of inter-process communication, IPC, right? So how do we have multiple processes talk to each other and what are the different ways they should be talking to each other, okay? Or might need to talk to each other. Sometimes they don't need to have full conversations where they're sending huge amounts of data from point A to B. Sometimes you just kind of need to, you know, something like that, right? You know, flag down a taxi, something like, you know, you wave your hand. You don't need to have a whole uh, conversation. Hey, I'm Mike, and uh, you know, how are you? Can you pull over here and let me get in the cab? We don't need that much information, right? Okay, just a little signal, and you got the, the, the ca taxi driver knows what, uh, know what, knows what you want. Um, all the worst part is in New York when you flag down a taxi, it's driving up, and then they turn their light off and just drive by. That's hilarious. Oh, I hate that. I just want to run them down, but I'm not that fast. <laughs> you just gotta stand right in front of them, so they have to stop. Yeah, like like the Russian people. Yeah. Who, uh, it's like, out <laughs> just, just arms up. See, that's why you need to use Uber. Or now you got Uber Taxi, which I mean, I actually think that's a really good solution. You know, for the uh, the taxi places that didn't like Uber coming into towns, um, you know, because it was taking away their business. Now you have Uber for taxis, right? So a taxi driver can now participate with Uber and still make income, which then helps the person who owns their medallion, because uh, taxis have medallions associated with them. So they're really expensive, at least in New York, to have a to have a cab. Um, it's like an investment. People invest in taxis, and uh, um, so it was taking away from those are the people that were screaming, not the taxi drivers specifically. The taxi drivers get a cut of what they make, but part of that goes into the person who's who's invested in them, if you will. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people would prefer to take a medallion taxi uh, than a random person in a car. I mean, I'm right for the random. Well, you know, whatever. I mean, you know, how, how trustworthy are the people driving the taxis either. But, you know, punchline is they have to be licensed and all this stuff. So, like, somebody like my wife, even though it costs a little <laughs> bit more, she would prefer to have the convenience of Uber for calling a taxi rather than waving them down and hoping they come by, right? But would prefer to pay a little bit extra and have what she perceives is the pre more premium product from a safety perspective or, or something like that. So kind of a good idea. That would be a technology example of where, you know, Uber's disruptive type of uh, approach has maybe turned into a, a, a rehashing of what's been a kind of a common way of doing things for years. Because we really needed to have a, a real-time way of requesting cabs rather than waving your arms out in the middle of nowhere, right? That's given the fact that we all have communication beacons with us all the time now, it makes sense for us to be able to request a cab that way. Yeah, I'd be screwed to catch That's cab. just, huh? I'd be screwed trying to catch cab. Can't you just flap your wing a little bit? No. The other one? The other wing? I mean, but I'm short, so I have to use both arms. So, <laughs> and do some hopping? Yeah. Uh, okay. So, in any case, um, you know, 
one of the ways that so we were talking about buffers in the context of shared memory. So shared memory is when we have multiple applications that have all agreed upon a centralized location where they might exchange information with each other. Okay, And the size of the buffer is going to limit the amount of information they can exchange. Okay, that's one way we can utilize a buffer. Uh, so I think somebody last time mentioned this is kind of like the singleton design pattern, right? Um, you know, that we've talked about in like the 390 class as well as maybe, I don't know if we've done it in another class, but whatever. Um, so that's, uh, um, you know, these, so we, we think about design patterns and the word singleton being this very modern theory-based thing that sounds so appropriate and very difficult and we're very smart because we even know that word, right? And the reality is it's, that idea has been around since the beginning of operating systems. And, you know, before that, uh, it was still around because we've been sharing, you know, containers of stuff for years and years and years. All of us in our garage or something like that have that drawer that had, that's junk. where the, that's where you yeah, had the junk, junk drawer, drawer, right? That's where the stuff that you can't find might be. That's right. Um, okay. So in any case, you know, one way we can use buffers as is a storage location for messages where we do limit the size of the message we might be able to send. Another way we can use a buffer is, is almost like a, a, a bouncer. Um, if you've ever gone into, um, you know, a lot, a lot of times some fancier hotels will have the, the turnstile things to, for the door to get in. And one of the advantages of those, it doesn't let wind blow in, right? That's, yeah. that's kind of the, the, the real advantage of that. But doesn't it also control the flow of how many people can come into the building at once? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, if a thing has uh, five cubbies in it, you know, perceived maximum is five unless you want to get buddy-buddy with somebody. I mean, have you ever tried doing that? I like because I one of my hobbies is making people kind of feel uncomfortable. Okay, and, and being big, you just squeeze right into one. It's like, hey, how are you doing? As <laughs> 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 you're, you're kind of bump, trying to you're shuffling over each other's feet. I usually also go around twice. Can't well, stop it with you. Are you one of those people that go like to the elevator and then like turn around? <laughs> <laughs> just face the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if I've ever seen that. <laughs> Somebody walks into an elevator and loses. I mean, maybe if the the, the two door elevators, right? It's not the two door. Yeah, it's, you're coming back out the way you came in, but your back's to it until it stops. I've done it when I'm on my phone before, and somebody's already hit the button. I'm like. Well, yeah, but most people at least at least partially swing around, you know, kind of do like a half swing and kind of lean into the corner or something, you know, but just to literally face the wall, like kind of crappie fish style. Depends. Ever watched, um, uh, if you've ever been to one of the, the, the fish tanks that have uh, freshwater fish in it, like Cabela's has one. Oh, yeah. You ever look at the crappie? The crappie are always, always up near a stone wall, just facing the wall. For no reason. All of them are there. Huh? What's the reason? They're out of the current. I don't know it's that they're necessarily tank. out of the current. Yeah, it's a fish tank. Yeah, you create currents in the fish tank. I don't think there's a strong current in Cabela's fish tank. There has to be in order for it to... Oh, well, I suppose for the water circulation system. Right here. Be good. <laughs> okay, let's hear it. I, I even missed, and I've been really interested in doing that this semester. Um, in order to filter and cycle a, a fish tank that big, you have to have really strong pumps in order to um, like cycle all the water through. And okay. Re so your your pumps are like they're in the corner somewhere, so they're they're literally pulling the water column towards them. Right. So there will be a current. Do you know those yeah. silos outside yeah. of Cabela's? Yeah. Those are filled with water for the fish tanks. Oh, okay. So so let's let's assume so so I that, that sounds it's stronger than your house. Yeah. So. That 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 sounds yeah. fair to me. I think that sounds accurate, but I'm not sure how the crappie where they're at how that would keep them out of the current. So I'm guessing it's like a group formation thing. Like so, the first fish will block the current for the rest of the fish. And then oh, so like, oh, so if I look, yeah, so this is interesting. Yeah, so if I look, if I kind of figure out which way the filter's pulling the water, yeah. I should maybe see the bigger fish in the first line of defense. Or, or maybe they just switch. I mean, kind yeah. of like geese. Like a, yeah, geese geese so that the front one's blocking the, the air for the rest of them, so it makes it easier for them to block. Okay, so, they, so somebody's taking the brunt of the, uh, at any point in time, and then they rotate. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that'd be my guess. Yeah, no, that is interesting. But that's how the crappie line up. They literally just face the wall. But so that that make, that makes some sense. Yeah. I'm just thinking, just go near a wall and drop a net in. <laughs> Come up with a bunch of crappie. <laughs> No maybe that was maybe that was Jesus's uh, that was Jesus's trick, right? <laughs> he said, "Just throw the net in over here, right?" So he just he saw the under under you know this. It's like you know he had the polarized uh, glasses. And he, <laughs> he saw there. was like, "Wait a minute, you know, hey, I see a little stone wall down. Just throw your net there. You come up with a bunch of crappie." <laughs> <laughs> that is Christian worldview. So it's just legit, I think, ish. Um, okay. Uh, so you can certainly use the buffer for like kind of a turn style type thing where we can control the flow into a resource. All right. So if at any point in time only one person's allowed to leave that turn style and there's a line on the inside, we can force people to stay within the turn style, right? So that turn style becomes kind of a, a, a control flow. Um, that's usually not how it's necessarily used in real life, but we can certainly extrapolate that that's how it could be used, right? I think the major use in real life is so you don't have wind constantly pouring into a place, um, but you know, whatever. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so here's an example of kind of a, a bounded buffer where we use modulus to kind of control who's allowed in next. You know, so if we have five slots, and there is uh, uh, zero people in there. We try to add one. Zero, to, zero divided by five is zero with remainder five. So we have, our, you know, we have spots, right? Okay. And we have one. We still have spots. Two, we have spots. Three, we have spots. Four, we have spots. Five, we have spots. Uh, five, we don't have spots. So the person has to wait. Six. Okay. Once it goes to six, six mod five actually has a remainder of one. Right? So five goes into six one time with remainder one to get to six. So now there is one empty spot. So we can actually keep incrementing how many things have entered the door. And if we mod it by the size of the buffer, it tells us how many open spots there are. Make sense? So modulus kind of allows us to have an infinite counter so we can count total number of people, total number of things that have tried to use a resource and still keep track of whether or not there's an open slot for another. Okay. Um, so, another good use of third grade math. Okay. All right, so now another type of interprocess communication is this idea of message passing. Okay, so we talked about this last time. Was it, was it, was it me sharing a note with Joel? I don't remember. Was I passing you notes? Or somebody else? Nobody remembers who got the note from me last time? It was Schumacher. Schumacher. Oh, where is Schumacher? Black Ops 3. <laughs> makes more sense now. That's not even a good excuse. Black Ops 3, come on. If it was Fallout no, was it? like any good game, maybe. I tortured Josh Locklear last night, by the way. Um, he's a big Fallout 4. He's waiting for it. So I took a picture. I emailed oh, it to him from my story. Gmail email. Oh, because it's not on the shelf yet, but you have yeah. it? Yeah. Man. So he's skipping class because of a video game? I will send a picture of the back of it that's got all sorts of stuff on it. Yeah, exactly. Well, I know that's why he said he couldn't come help me with the uh, boat motor tonight. Is, well, he said, I'm not available tomorrow night, but I read between the lines. I previously knew the story of the game, but... Hey. Huh? Did you find any help for the boat motor? Yeah, we got people. How many? Uh, well, we got two right now. Well, two plus me should be able to lift something. That's true. You weigh as much as a book mom. Yeah. Maybe. I don't, if we get some more, if we get some more people, it'd be helpful. But I think we, given current resources, we should be able to pull it off. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. So another mechanism for interprocess communication is something called message passing. Uh, so you know, this is process to communicate with and synchronize their actions. So message passing processes communication with each other without resorting to a shared variable. So rather than having one shared place, we now have to establish a mechanism for having communication between two processes. Okay, So both processes don't necessarily know about one centralized place that so they just keep checking. Instead, now they're going to talk directly to each other, like kind of like a text message. Okay, So interprocess uh, communication facility provides two operations. So we have a send and a receive message. 
not rocket science, right? Okay, when we send a message, we have uh, either a message can be a fixed size or it can be a variable size, kind of like bounded or unbounded uh, um, buffers. Okay, so we, we could limit the size of the message we're allowed to uh, send in, um, you know, or we could just accept any string, whatever, and then we can actually receive a message of what? Um, so let's see, P and Q wish to communicate. They need to first establish some sort of communication link with each other, however that's going to happen. We'll look at some examples of that. And then exchange information between send and receive. So the real life example is what? Uh, when, uh, um, if I send a text message to one of you guys, or I'll let's use Slack as an example. All right, so if I send a private message to one of you on Slack, we've both established a communication link with each other by both being members of that Slack, uh, that Slack network in our, you know, cwcs.slack.com thing, right? All right, so now I can send a private message to you and it goes directly to you because we both kind of joined that, that, that same network. Go ahead. Um, so in terms of actually 390 with our Apple Watch and iPhone app, would that be the same style of communication where the watch is talking to the phone? Um, at least at high level, okay. yeah. I mean, the way they actually implement it was going to be their own little take on yeah. this, um, because we're we're talking about it at the operating system level, as as opposed to something that lives at a layer above the operating system, right? So, uh, you know, you have an iPhone and you have an Apple Watch, and these guys need to talk to each other. Well, there's an operating system living on the phone. There's an operating system living on the watch. So now we're talking about one process living on this operating system, talking to another process living on this operating operating system. How does that happen? So we establish a communication channel through Bluetooth or, or something like that. So similar concept, but you know, it's 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 not a direct interprocess communication. Uh, well, at least not an operating system. It would be distributed operating system interprocess communication. I guess I guess would be the best the best way to look at it. I guess. Um, let's see implementation of a communication link. Uh, so we can either do this physical through either shared memory or a hardware bus or, you know, actually you could take it a step further and literally say it's a, you know, a wire. So that wouldn't necessarily work for processes. But if we had, you know, two things that needed to talk to each other, we can certainly, you know, we've seen the soup cans with the string, right? <laughs> so <laughs> you know, it would look a little funny in your operating systems to say, well, you know, you, you, the problem is you, you know, you, well, you need some more twine. Follow the chef boy or either spaghettios. That'd be really funny if you go into to Geek Squad or you know the Genius Bar at Apple and they say your iMac needs more twine <laughs> for for communication. You know, for some customers though, they would believe it. Probably sixty percent. Yeah. Well, and, and, and actually, it's related to a show I was watching the, this morning. Um, talks about how people perceive different things and uh, it's like, you know, something with like brain games or something like that. And uh, first of all, they had two people that would just deliver a message. They were standing there and one of them would say, I have the best deal for you, blah, 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 trust me. And the other person would say basically the same words. And, um, but the, the people kind of looked a little different. And the, uh, the, the folks looking at those folk, people listening to their message would have to choose which one of the two people they would trust. And like, I don't know, 90% of them all chose the same person. They basically thought, based on appearance alone, some people look trustworthy versus not being trustworthy, right? Um, uh, no, but I mean, it's actually a very interesting perception thing. So similarly, they had a, a, another thing. You know, for all you know, uh, the guy who they didn't trust might be the one with the real information, right? And the other guy was just a complete shyster or something. You know, um, you know now, but in, uh, so let's take... Uh, another example from that, they had a news reporter, guy looked official, dressed, dressed the part, had the, 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 you know, the microphone and all that stuff, and was saying, so they released a report, you know, such and such from NASA, uh, you know, ex-chief from NASA released the report this morning that, uh, um, the, uh, um, that the Americans never actually landed on the moon. Um, what, do you, what do you have to say about that? And people just took it as fact and started commenting on it as if some of them as if they had already heard about it. Uh, it's, it seemed like, um, and it was because they fell immediately into a trusting position of that of that person. And don't we have um, the same thing in here? Whenever I tell you something, you're just trusting. I know what I'm talking about. No, no. I could literally be making up anything that I mean. What? No, there's a slide with dinosaurs on it. There's no. <laughs> <laughs> no, that mean you're, 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 you're supporting it with slides with dinosaurs on it. But I mean, isn't it interesting 
the number of things that we what we do in life that we just uh, that we just treat as as trustworthy. And isn't that I mean like isn't this, if you're in a place that you're not supposed to be, the best thing to do is act like you're supposed to be there, right? Uh, when my wife and I were in, um, this is when we first got married. We were in uh, Las Vegas, and we were going to some show at the Bellagio Hotel. Um, but That's the cab, married, yeah, the, the cab dropped us off on the wrong side of the building. If you've ever been to Vegas, these hotels are big. So walking around the building would be a, so we went in the employee entrance. All right. Just walked right in. Like we, like we own the place, like no big deal. I have a picture of my wife standing next to like the employee of the month picture. <laughs> we ended up taking one of the, um, uh, the service elevators up to one of the floors uh, then we could cross over to the normal pedestrian elevator and go back down to the, the, the other side of the building. We were coming in and out of like where the casino back doors were and stuff. Like it was nothing. That's Nobody crazy. even, we were passing all sorts of people in the hall. Nobody even gave us a second look. Wow. That's. Yeah. I mean, but wouldn't any of you think that that could certainly happen? I mean, yeah. Could I walk into Grafton Best Buy, put a Best Buy shirt on, and head back into the stock room and probably not get stopped? They would just assume I'm a new employee. You don't make your size. Yep. <laughs> you get what I'm saying. Actually, I probably don't even need a Best Buy shirt. I probably just need a blue-ish shirt. No, white shirt. It's white now. White polo. Well, no, white polo. All our new employees wear white polo. Fine. I'll That's just put. I'll just put on like a dirty T-shirt. They'll just assume I'm a delivery guy. Just have to bring a, a, a trolley with me, right? A dolly, dolly, trolley, dolly, same thing. I'll be on my hoverboard. Uh, the most control you can have over someone is having their trust. Yeah, so I mean, kind of, kind of very interesting, I guess. I don't know how I got off of that, but... Randy, um, Randy made a good comment. Oh, no, I was just saying, he said, like, the whole basis between um, um, like social engineering. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so for, like, computer hacking stuff, if you've ever seen the movie Hackers... You know, they one of the ways they did, they had to get physical access to a machine, so they went in and they installed something, but they pretended to be a telephone repairman. That, you know, that would be more of a physical thing, but, you know, at the very beginning of the movie, the guy called, you know, he wanted to hack into some cable stations, something or other, so he called the security guard and said, you know, this is such and such, and I have a big project, you know, from accounting, and I have a big project for Mr you know, Yamasuki or something like that due tomorrow. Can you read me the phone number off the modem? This was back when that made sense. Um, <laughs> you know, can you read me? And the guy just read the number like it was no big deal. Just assume the person needed this information and, you know, he's going to be in big trouble just helping a fellow employee out, right? So, I don't know, kind of. Well, at that point, the computers were already screwy in there. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I'm just saying in general, it's, oh, it, yeah. you know, trust does turn into kind of a, a big thing and, um, yeah, the show is really interesting because it's constantly just dealing with people's perception of things and, you know, how we're so, uh, malleable. Have you seen, yeah. uh, Mr. Robot? Mm-hmm, yep. Yeah, they do, they do that. That, that show get renewed? <clears throat> I, I don't know if it got renewed. I just finished the first season. Okay. I, I want to say, yeah, but it was, the subreddit seemed to be active enough. Yeah. Talking about it, so. At first I didn't like Christian Slater in it, but then, it, yeah. then he sort of grew on me. I don't know, I'm like I keep flip flopping on whether I really like it or I really don't like it. Okay. Know, like, yeah. I, I I totally get what you're saying. Like, cause they'll like sometimes use like IRL and AFK, and when they like say that out loud, it feels like, goofy. Ugh, no, yeah. That's not how yeah. hackers talk. Yeah. Right. 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 That's true. Yeah. That's true. Um, okay, so you know we have to have some way of establishing the communication link. So we're kind of talking about a high level here, uh, high level idea of message passing here. We we need to text, be able to send and receive text from a human being perspective, right? In order to do that, we need to have a communication link established between the two processes somehow. However, that happens. Okay, however. Uh, 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 two processes establish a communication link. We might both agree upon, um, you know, when we both are created, we might go and agree upon uh, uh, something centralized. So, for instance, on uh, the new, um, I think it's on iPhone as well, but uh, at least on the Mac OS, they have something called Central Dispatch or Dispatch Central, one of the two. Okay, And that's basically they check in with that place and then things can be joined up there. Okay. Otherwise, they need to talk directly to each other through some mechanism. Okay, so we can either have a physical connection, as they're saying, either through shared memory or a hardware bus, uh, 
or through a logical connection, which might be through that like central dispatch where they both checked in, said, you know, I am open, you know, I'm at my desk and my phone is, you know, I am my, I'm, I'm open for business. You can call my phone if you need to. Uh, that way that person can now be communicated, um, uh, can, they can communicate with them. Uh, so this is kind of, you know, how do we establish these links? Uh, can a link be associated with more than two processes? So is uh, message passing something that can happen uh, just between two processes or can we have a whole group? So now we start thinking about chat rooms. Does Do chat rooms make sense? Sure. So probably would want this to support communication through multiple processes, especially when we consider um, the situation where we can have a single process that forks multiple child processes, right? You know, there's, there's no guarantee that we're just going to have one parent, one child in that kind of scenario. Similarly, if we have an, uh, a, a, you know, the, the, the most common situation of having communication be between processes is when we have multiple processes that all came from the same source. So they're all kind of solving a similar task. But they're all the Photoshop processes. So you've got five Photoshop processes. It might make sense for those guys to want to kind of associate with each other, right? So certainly we, as an implementation question, we might say, does it make sense to have more than two processes linked in this way? The short answer for us is probably, right? Go ahead. So like with inter-process communication, if it's set up like in a really, really well-structured way, mm -hmm. couldn't that just make, um, essentially make coupling not a, a drawback, like using... Well, because you, like you said, coupling is bad to have. But if if your communication structure between application or between processes are is set up correctly and in a way that's very very efficient, then if one process is relying on the other one, well, isn't the implementation of how things communicate with each other an example of coupling? If this process has a direct link to this other process, they're coupled. Okay. okay, whether they're sharing code or whether they are reliant on each other being able to send messages, they're coupled. Now, if both of these processes connect into some centralized thing up here, where that centralized thing kind of manages that communication between all the other processes, that's at least less coupled. Um, you know, because now these guys aren't, this guy can die without this guy being left out to pasture, potentially. Okay, but if these two guys are performing multiple or performing tasks that are closely related to each other, they might be very dependent on each other, and any sort of dependency through between multiple processes would be an example of coupling. Okay, coupling isn't just a physical thing where code is shared or something like that. It's a dependency. In fact, it it's I would say it's much more a dependency based thing than anything about physical shared stuff. All right. Um, Let's see, how many links can there be between every pair of communicating processes? So, again, this starts coming into, you know, we start connecting this to real life type things. Um, uh, how do we communicate? So, for instance, if I'm going to message Nick, I have options. Okay, I can send Nick a email. I can send him a text. I can call him. I can post something through Slack. Uh, I can, uh, right let's, let's just... Write to me on my wrist. <laughs> I can, uh, yeah, I can, oh, that's true. I can go through the, the, the phone. I can send in my heartbeat with the, with the, with the, the watch, rather. Um, so let's just say that's the end of the collection, right? So in terms of our convenient ways of communicating today, I have several different ways of communicating with this additional process, okay? Do we have to have a zillion different ways, or is one way enough for multiple processes? Again, these are implementation questions, uh, and we have to think about the kind of the nature of an operating system. Operating systems have been around for a long time, and they do need to be backwards compatible, at least to a point, right, with previous versions of it. So if you have a software application that ran on Windows 95, let's say, um, you would at least have a reasonable expe expectation that that software would continue to run on Windows 10, Right? You know, it wouldn't completely horribly shock you if it didn't, but most of us, I think, would have the expectation that applications that ran on Windows 95 would still run today, okay? So, therefore, any design decisions that were made in Windows 95, however, inter-process communication was implemented back then, 
compared to our newer, cooler ways of doing it today, where a new application written you know, last week would probably use some of the newer structures for doing it. Uh, well, we still need to support those older structures. So now we have uh, system calls that exist inside the operating system that allow us to set up things that maybe wouldn't make sense today, but made sense two, three, five, ten years ago or more, okay, um, that need to still work because there's certain applications that are going to still rely on it. Make sense? That's part of this question that we have to answer is, you know, uh, well, I mean, this, this question specifically says, do we need to have more than one way initially, you know, for a two process to communicate, um, uh, to communicate, or do we need to have the ability for them to share messages differently? And this kind of goes back to how interprocess communication actually works. So, for instance, with shared memory, um, let's say that there are uh, three or four different types of messages that Nick and I are going to share as two separate processes, okay? Well, we can choose to use one shared memory resource to send all of our messages if that might make sense, okay? But we might need to send two messages at the same time. Okay, maybe I'm letting him know that I'm ready to do, you know, go to the movies or whatever, or I'm also hungry, okay, in real life, you know, if we're communicating with people, all right? We're going, I'm taking you to the movies? We're going to see the new Star Wars movie? Is that, <laughs> when does that come out? Uh, December, December 17th. Okay. I already have a ticket. I already have a ticket? Yeah. You all by yourself? No, group Speaking group of what? Friends from work. I have a bunch of friends. <laughs> Rel <laughs> related to that? <laughs> I was about to. I was literally about to say that <laughs> you're going to miss the final exam because of Star Wars. I'll probably leave. <laughs> I mean, there's a, there's reasonable excuses. Well, actually, that, let's say that's not a reasonable excuse. But given the fact that he's proven it's important enough this far in advance, that's a reasonable enough excuse, right? I mean, it's no, it's not really any better than a new video game coming out. But you can plan around it this far in advance. Okay? Yeah. So you can take it early. Yeah, so what I'll do is as punishment, I'll make him take the exam like some like crazy early hour. <laughs> in the morning. Well, no, I'm not getting up at 2.30 in the morning. I can't stay up until 2.30 in the morning. I'm old. And decrepit. Seriously. It's okay. I'm, by the time I reach your age, I'll be this. I know. It's terrible. It is terrible. Um, okay, so, you know, these are things that we do need to consider that sometimes a single communication link between two processes might not be enough, depending on the problem those processes need to solve. Now, at the same time, do we allow an infinite number of communication links between two processes? Probably not, right? So where's the answer in between? Doesn't this kind of go back to what we talked about earlier when we we're talking about CPU scheduling and things like that, where there's this weird kind of like unscientific threshold. We're almost making a best guess on how people are likely to use the operating system, how people are likely to write software um, as to what the limit is, right? And there, there isn't really a right or wrong answer. We're making a best guess that we'll just fix it in the next revision, you know, if users use our software differently. But now, if users use our software differently now, that doesn't mean it's, that's not necessarily going to dictate how people use software in five or ten years, right? I mean, as the world keeps changing, we keep doing things differently. Don't most of us make less phone calls today than we made ten years ago? What's a phone no. call? Really? I definitely, I definitely make more phone calls than I did 20 years ago. Well, yeah, I mean, so, so I guess the, the connection I'm trying to make here is <laughs> think about when you first got a cell phone. Didn't you, use it. Okay. Well, um, in general, so let's say you're the that, anomaly. That's all you in general, when you first got a cell phone, um, the main use of that was likely phone calls. Yeah, call okay? phones. So okay, but them. now when you think about your cell phones, the main use may not be phone calls. Porn. The, <laughs> <laughs> also recorded. Okay. Um, main use is, you know, for, for me at least, you know, whether that's normal or not, you know, I primarily use my cell phone for texting, email. Slack and web, right? And then I, I play some games on there or something like that. But but the fact that it makes a phone call is literally a feature I would not miss. What if you need dial nine one one? I think my car can do it. <laughs> 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 All right, but so I mean the the punchline is is that we still call it a phone, 
But the fact that it can make phone calls is not one of the most important features on this device to me. Okay, How many of you would agree with that for you? I don't know if this is necessarily the case, but I mean, we might still want it to make phone calls, but does it make the top three list? Yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> you know what's my number yeah. one. Okay. Does, 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 does the cell phone, does the phone feature make the top three list? And that's, that's really changed over the years, right? And we can certainly find other examples uh, of, of that, right? I got to have a way to look up cool pictures. <laughs> Um, same thing with our the way we use our television sets. Very similar, right? Okay, We're always viewing something through the screen, but as the years go on, the things that we're viewing on TV and the means by which we view them changes, right? Today, we live in a world where a lot of people stream, right? You know, how many of you at home don't even have cable? You just rely on Netflix or internet stuff, things like that. Similarly, how many of you don't even have... Uh, um, uh, landline phones at home, right? Oh, okay, a lot of people replace those with cell phones we now, right? Shove those in the back right. aisle at Best Buy. Yeah, so I mean, the, the so the punchline is things that were completely commonplace before have now changed, right? So just because the operating system, as an operating system the des designer, we make a choice today as to how we think people are using the operating system. And then over the next year, we make adjustments based on how people are actually using that operating system. We can't necessarily sit on those facts as being long-term solutions because in three or four years, as new applications come out, as the way people view computing changes – we're going to change the way that we actually use our operating systems, which very well might negate some decision that used to make sense. Go ahead. Kind of a real world example of that is in terms of TVs, like with the evolution of the smart TV and features mm -hmm. built into them. Yeah, cause, sure. Yeah. Um, but okay, so let's even take that. For instance, um, in my perception, I would never buy a smart TV. Um, at least not a smart TV that couldn't easily have the software updated. Yeah. Okay, My perception is, is that the smart TVs kind of have a built-in set of features that are likely going to be outdated in six months or eight months. I'd rather get the hockey puck, uh, whether it's an Apple TV or a Roku or a Google a Google device, whatever, you know, a, you know um, what, Chromecast or an Amazon one, something that is going to be good for a while. It's going to have software updates. It's going to get the new stuff on it. And eventually, as soon as it no longer is up to snuff with whatever is available out there new, I'll drop $100 and get the new version of that, right? Okay. As opposed to having this TV with an antiquated piece of technology in it that I don't use. So to me, it doesn't make sense. Similarly, um, uh, television sets that have built-in HD tuners. Okay. They're, they, they, don't, they're not, they don't happen as often now. Most TVs are actually just monitors now, but that for a time period when high definition TVs first came out, you would pay a premium for a TV that had an HD tuner built into it, and also cable cards. They have a, like a, a special slot that you could put a cable card in it, so you didn't need the the cable box, right? Yeah, but now really cable good. boxes are a major part of you know, like we have um, a UVerse at home, and the fact that we have a cable box is, you know, no big deal because that's where the hard drive lives that we use for all our recordings, right? Okay. Our TVs um, at our house had built-in DVRs in them back when DVRs weren't popular. So we paid some crazy premium for this TV way back when. Luckily, they lasted a long time. Um, but the, the punchline is, is those DVRs stopped working a long time ago. Okay. In fact, and what ended up happening is, is one of our TVs was on the fritz. It wasn't working very well. And part of it like was, huh? I said, is this why you don't like Best Buy? No, I didn't get this from Best Buy. Okay. And part of that was because the software that was trying to start up the hard drive for the, uh, um, uh, for the DVR, the built-in DVR, which we didn't use, couldn't start the hard drive because the hard drive had failed. So the fix was go in, take the panel off, and just unplug the hard drive. You know, and then the TV started working again. You know, so it's, uh, you know, I guess my view just through that experience has been, I don't like integrated products. I'd rather get the best of separate products that all link together to give me the best ultimate experience that allow me to then swap out individual pieces. Samsung actually took a, an interesting approach to that in terms of, like, hardware and TVs or something becoming antiquated. 
with a, what they call like an evolution kit. Mm-hmm. It's just a box you plug into the back of the TV, and it overrides the hardware inside. So okay. Bring it up. Yeah, fair enough. Today. Fair enough. It's been interesting. Um, but, I mean, wouldn't the same thing be true? So, several of you in here probably have video game systems that you've built, right? Okay. If you're a hardcore PC gamer, your machine of choice isn't going to be an iMac style machine or an all-in-one style machine from HP, right? It might be great the day it comes out of the box in terms of the games that are out there today, okay? But your ability to upgrade that thing is going to be limited to RAM and hard drive if you're adventurous, right? I mean, that's, that's the punchline. I mean, if you've ever tried to, and actually upgrading the hard drive in one of the newer iMacs is, is kind of off the table because they use a lot of glue. Um, but the older iMacs that are a little bit thicker, they don't use the glue, but you have to be very uh, um, careful about screen? which screws you take off. Yeah, I mean, you use, a, you use a suction cup to pull the screen off. Okay, and the screen's actually, it's held on by magnets. All right, but uh, then you uh, just take a couple of screws out and then the, the monitor basically falls forward. But behind it, there's, well, let's round down and say four billion wires, okay, that are holding that thing on, okay? And you don't want to hang it from those wires because you don't know what, which one's going to unplug. So whenever I replace a, uh, I have a technique for replacing hard drives in 27-inch iMacs, or, well, the thicker iMacs, the ones that still have the, 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 the DVD player in it. I haven't tried it with one of the newer ones because I'm afraid of the glue. But I put it up on my stove. That just happens to be the right height. It has nothing to do with the stove. <laughs> Turn the burners on high. <laughs> okay. And what I do is I take pillows off my couch. <laughs> and I wedge the pillows between my stomach and the under part of the screen. Okay. So that the screen could fall forward and lay on the pillows but not stretch the wires. And then I do all the work behind it, <laughs> behind it to, to just take the right screws out that are the minimal necessary screws to take out. Uh, to put a new hard drive in, or, 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 uh, or, well, really just hard drive. Electric ovens have their uses. You remember the PS3. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's true. I cooked okay. it on the sofa. You know, so the, the, the punchline is, is that you would not get an all-in-one machine if your goal is gaming, even though a machine like that is extremely convenient, right? You know, I have a machine that would be great for gaming in my office. I have a nice 5K iMac in there with... <clears throat> Tons of RAM and fastest, latest, greatest processor, and it would be great for gaming today. Okay. In a year, it's going to be less great for gaming. In two years, it's probably going to be useless for gaming if you don't, well, actually, I can play some, uh, um, I can probably keep playing the latest, greatest games with a bunch of stuff turned down, is the punchline. So, But for most hardcore PC gamers, your goal is to always have everything maxed, Right? Or, or as close to it as possible. So you need to have a machine that you can you can interchange stuff in. That's that's part of why you're trading off the convenience of where you need to store it and the amount of wires that are coming out of it and stuff like that for the power that you'll get as a return. Okay, so it's the right tool for the job if you're a hardcore gamer. You know, I'm not really a hard, I'm, uh, I guess I don't know if I was ever a hardcore gamer because, I mean, I was like a professional WoW player, but most gamers don't consider MMOs hardcore gaming. Right, first-person shooters are more of a skill-based thing. WoW is more of a time thing, right? To a certain extent, and I was never good at PvP. I was all PVE, so that's even more not a skill thing. It's a time-in thing. Um, but punchline punchline is is even when I played video games a lot, uh, um, you know, the machine I have now probably would have been perfectly adequate uh, for what I did. Um, but for a lot of you. Performance, especially in first-person shooter type stuff, the performance of your machine is actually quite important to your success in the game, right? I mean, you know, even with the, for me, if I'm playing WoW, if I have the graphics turned all, I mean, I usually play with the sound off, right? <laughs> I guess it just bugs me. I want to watch Netflix or something like that while I'm while I'm raiding. Yeah, well, I, I play the raids by, well, I play the new raids by hand. But, um, yeah, while I'm botting, I don't even care. I don't even keep the monitor on. <laughs> So the fact that my computer has a monitor attached to it is completely unnecessary for most of my game playing today. Game playing. Um, But in any case, it's about using the right tool for the job, and that right tool for the job changes over time. So we can't, as an operating system designer, there's far less science involved than than we'd like to think. There's a lot of guesswork. 
uh, with operating systems. And it, it actually becomes kind of an intriguing thing because there's a psychology to it. Um, how many of you are taking the human computer interaction class or have had the human computer interaction class? Okay, so on the surface, that class sounds like it would be kind of useless, right? Okay, maybe boring. It probably is boring. Okay, but the punchline is, is that as you go through the class and as you get an appreciation for uh, what things are in there, you start seeing maybe kind of what I'm talking about here that, that you take two interfaces that are both trying to solve the same problem. One can be far more effective than another one because it's taking human psychology and stuff like that into consideration. How human beings prefer to interface with their computers. All right, same thing goes if you put a laptop in front of yourself. Why don't more laptops now have touch screens? Okay. It really doesn't make sense for the way we've gotten used to using computers. So even if you're one of these folks that have the, uh, the Microsoft Surface tablets, when you're in laptop mode, most of the time you're going to be using the mouse and the keyboard, right? As opposed to a whole lot of touching on the screen. You, know, you might you know, do some tapping you know, here and there, but in general we have a means by which we use laptops and we have a means by which we use tablets, and when it's in transformer mode as a laptop, we use it like a laptop. Okay, so it is the right tool for the job. Um, okay, so we'll come back on, I want to see when we're going to probably have our next assignment. We might have it Monday, if not Monday, we'll have it Wednesday for where we're going. Cool? Have a good weekend.